as I said earlier, um, the theme of today's message is about how do I stop my faith from losing its sight, uh, its light, sorry. You know, it's, it's really easy to, and it's really easy for our faith to lose its light in the world if we forget some of the foundational things about Jesus. This is a dark world that we live in, and darkness will always settle upon us if we don't let our light shine. And you remember at the start of John's Gospel about the theme of light and darkness and how God's light comes into the world. But we can get very absorbed by the world if we are not diligent and intentional about our worship. So how do we live as light in the world as Christ calls us to do so? How do we stop our faith from losing its light? If you look around, you'll see lots of different expressions of the Christian faith. Even in a local church like ours, you see some people are full on for God. Some people are lukewarm. Some people are just hanging in there with their faith because of life circumstances. Some people are just up and down in their faith. When you look at Jesus and his life, you will see that Jesus showed incredible zeal in his life, incredible passion. Jesus was radical. He was controversial. He was courageous. And he was totally unashamed about God in his life. You find this story that we just read here earlier that it was the time of the Passover. And it was during this Passover festival that Jesus' anger drove him into violent action. Jesus was turning the money changers' tables over. And as he was doing that, as he, so just try and imagine this picture of Jesus. Often we just think of the gentle Jesus, but here we see a very angry Jesus to the point where he's kicking tables over in the temple and makes a whip and drives people out. And what that really shows in that moment is not an angry man, but really what is most important to Jesus. And that is worship God without any corruption at all in your life. We must worship God without any corruption. And during this Passover feast, you see that John is also leading towards the theme of Jesus being the Passover lamb himself. Remember earlier on, John the Baptist saw Jesus and says, there is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So now we find Jesus here in the temple during the Passover festival. The Passover was, even though it was a religious time for the Jewish people, the Passover was also a time of big business. It was big business at the time. You see, like most good things that we start in church or in, in life, they start off with good intentions, uh, good spiritual intentions. And then over time, if you lose your focus, it turns into a big commercial enterprise. Take, for example, Christmas. Christmas began with really good intentions, where the early church decided to substitute the celebration of the sun god in the pagan world that they lived in. The sun god Ra was worshipped on December the 25th. And the churches decided, we're going to substitute that and worship the birth of the Son of God. And over time, what has happened to Christmas? It's become so commercialized these days that Christ himself is lost 
in all of that celebration. It's replaced by food and alcohol and parties, debauchery even in the Christmas season. Take Easter, it's no different. This is a time for Christians to pray and reflect on Jesus Christ, on the death and resurrection of Christ. It's become one of the most commercial times in the calendar of, of the year where so much chocolate is eaten and bought. And a lot of people are doing this and wishing each other Happy Easter without even realizing what Easter is about. The Passover was becoming like that as well. Now the Passover festival required a sacrifice and people would travel from all over the world to come to Jerusalem this one time of the year, very special time to remember the Passover. And they would come from all over the world to sacrifice at the temple. It meant a lot to them. The merchants and the temple leaders turned something that was a necessity into a commercial opportunity to the point where the temple area itself, which is reserved for worship, for fellowship and solemn prayer, turned into a noisy marketplace. And what it did was it exposed the hypocrisy of the leaders at the time. And as Jesus got angry, and as he turned the tables over, he began to expose the hypocrisy that was in the hearts of the leaders because it was during that action that Jesus did that the leaders began to plot to kill him and to get rid of him. So this should also be a reminder for us. When Jesus exposes the hypocrisy in our own hearts. Because until your own hypocrisy is exposed, the death of Jesus won't make any sense. You see, it was because the hypocrisy was exposed that led to Jesus' death. So until our hypocrisy is exposed and you realize how you respond to Christ when he exposes your hypocrisy, then you will understand the significance of his death. You see what religion does? Religiosity takes away the impact of the cross because it tries to justify its fruitless actions. We should be careful how we twist and justify our actions, that they appear spiritual but make no contribution at all to our relationship with God. It only distracts us from the meaning of the cross where Jesus died for our sins. And as Jesus is turning these tables upside down in the temple, in, this story is recorded in the other Gospels as well. And Jesus says, stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Jesus says, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. You see, Jesus didn't come to reform religion. He came to remove it. He didn't come to reform religion. He came to re re remove it. God's name should be honored and given glory above all else. Our faith should never be commercialized. It should never be superficial. We can never water down or compromise the gospel or our worship of God. Worship of God is everything. Everything from how we live, how we live at home, behind closed doors, how we treat one another when no one else is watching, how we entertain others, how we carry ourselves at work, how we even conduct Sunday church services, how we do ministry, how we do evangelism, 
God must be given the glory in everything that we do. And he must be given glory in purity of heart. Christ is our temple. Christ is our temple. When you start looking at this, this story and this account, you will see that Jesus' ultimate action was not just cleaning the temple, but actually replacing it with himself. And that's a big claim for Jewish years. He's not just cleaning the temple, he's replacing it with himself. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. That's a bold statement to make in the temple in Jerusalem. Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. What's he saying? That the new temple is coming and he is the new temple. Christ himself is the new temple. And John later on in Revelation 21 verse 22 says this, when he sees the future glory and the return of Christ, when he sees heaven coming down to earth, when God has made his home with his people, he says this, I saw no temple in the city. I saw no temple for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You see, being a Christian and living as a Christian begins in Christ. As you enter into Christ, just like you would enter into a temple, you are walking into Christ. He is the temple. And you walk into that temple with a humble, contrite heart, just as we read in Psalm 51, where you are able to admit your sins, be able to have your sins exposed, your hypocrisy exposed before Jesus, where you can receive God's forgiveness and his love through Christ. If you want to maintain the light of your faith, don't turn your faith and your church into a religious temple. What you need to do is you need to let Jesus kick over some tables in your life. You need to let Jesus kick over some tables in your life. So ask yourself this morning, what are some of the things in your life that looks like that temple? What needs to be kicked over in your personal life? Are you being salt? Are you being a light in this world? Are you serving others? Can you make your heart and your personal life holy and sacred, a holy and sacred place for the Holy Spirit? Because that's what holiness is, where you set yourself apart for God. That's, what it, that's why the temple was considered holy. It was set aside for the glory of God. Make your life holy. Set it apart for God in purity. Now that doesn't mean that you become religious. It doesn't mean that you become a moral police condemning others, going around, kicking tables over in church. But you should take some time to evaluate what you do get angry about. Think about the things that do make you angry. And when you get angry about those things, think about the fact that, is that something Jesus would get angry about? Or is it just you getting angry about something that might be a little bit irrelevant? So what is the value of the things that you are actually getting angry and worked up about? That would define whether or, or actually show whether you're like a moral police 
just condemning everyone around you? Or actually, is your heart connected with what Jesus' heart is connected with? You know, I was really moved yesterday when I was watching the news and I heard the announcement of the recipient of the Nobel Prize. Did anyone know, see that? The Nobel Prize winner, Nagas Mohammadi. She's an impressive woman. She's still in jail. She can't even receive her award because she is in prison. This woman has been fighting for human rights for her whole life in Iran and fighting for the rights of women and opposing the death penalty in her country. And she's living in a place where women are killed or severely beaten up simply because the headscarf isn't put on properly. There's moral policemen going around everywhere, just arresting people, putting them in jail, beating them up, abusing them in jail. And this lady is fighting for rights of women in her country. She has received over 150 lashings for what she is standing up for. She's serving a jail time of 30 years at the moment. But the world is recognizing that. But these are the things we should be getting angry about. We should be getting angry about evil and injustice in the world. Yet in churches today, the practice of our faith sometimes can be so shallow that we get worked up about little things that don't go our way. And churches split over petty little things and they're trying to act like Jesus kicking over tables in the church. But that's not what Jesus is on about. Church history is also stained with Christians oppressing others in religious zeal and abuse of power. Jesus got angry because there's nothing worse than religious abuse and oppression. There is nothing worse in this world than religious abuse and oppression in God's name. It is one of the worst forms of blasphemy because what you're doing is you're portraying God as an evil and oppressive God rather than a good, loving God. A right relationship with Jesus will allow for the right type of anger and appropriate action. It will also give you freedom in not being a moral police about everything. Instead of Jesus being the one to kick tables over in our lives, sometimes many people kick Jesus out of their lives because they don't want to be exposed of their hypocrisy. That's why I love Psalm 51. And it's been speaking to me all week about creating in me a clean heart. This should be our prayer every day. It should be repenting of our sins. Humble, contrite heart before God, constantly coming to him and saying, God, create in me a clean heart. Kick those tables over. Cleanse me like you cleanse that temple and let your Holy Spirit come into me. Cast me not away, cast me not away from your face. Renew a right spirit in me. That is what we want, isn't it? When, you, when your relationship is right with God, you will have the righteous anger of Christ against evil and injustice in this world. And your, your energy and your ministry and your direction will be directed towards those things and not some of the petty little things that we get worked up about in life. So let's pause for a moment and pray and ask God in the quietness of your own heart and your space, your body is a temple because the Holy Spirit lives in you. 
what needs to be cleansed in there. Christians aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. I know you're not perfect. What needs to be changed? Every day, something in our lives needs to be worked on. Maybe God is already working on something in your life right now that you're struggling with. Can I ask you to just let Jesus come in and kick that table over? Get rid of it. Let God cleanse your heart because he is the only one who can do it. So let's pause and ask you to close your eyes and bow your head and let the Holy Spirit examine your heart in this moment. What does Jesus need to turn over in your life that's making you lose the light of your faith? Is it greed? Is it lust? Is it hypocrisy? Is it a need for power or control? Is it a lack of love for others? Is it a mask that you wear to hide your insecurity? What is it that needs to be kicked over? Our Lord God, we lay our hearts before you. Our Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move in our hearts. We come to your mercy seat because it's only before you, Father, we, we find forgiveness and love. Our religious actions only hide our hypocrisy and our sins. It does nothing for our relationship with you. And the psalmist says you, you don't desire, you don't need sacrifices, you don't need the blood of bulls, but you want a broken and contrite heart. And help us to remember that, Lord God. Let our hearts be broken before you. We pray for healing, I pray for forgiveness, I pray for strength. I pray that your joy would come once our hearts are laid before you. I pray for restoration. I pray that through that we, we discover you in a deeper, deeper way and a new, fresh way where we can, we can understand your love for us and your desire to, to make us anew in Christ. Help us to have the same passion and zeal that Jesus had. Lord, help us to see in injustice around us and evil and corruption around us. And help us to be a light in this world through our faith in Jesus Christ. Help us to glorify you in, in everything that we do, Lord. I pray that that your name be glorified and that your good news will, will just flow out of our lives and our speech and our actions because our hearts are always right with you, Lord. We thank you for the blood of Christ. We thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We look to Christ as the new temple. You are our temple, Lord God, and we want to live in you. We want to have our lives, our being, 
in you, Lord God, so that we can know your peace, we can know your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.